So, I have a confession. I'm an academic. Uh, <laughs> that's bad enough, I know. Um, I wasn't always, obviously, but uh, I've always had a creative approach to studying and to research. As an errant teenager, I spent a lot of time in school skiving off and bunking off down to the local secondhand bookshop where I would read everything I could get my hands on on the esoteric and left field science. I developed a kind of passion for what we might call exceptional human experience, altered states of consciousness and psychedelics later on as well. I wanted to extend that interest in study and went off to university to try and understand these experiences through the lens of psychology. I did a degree, I'd spent three years and I learned a lot about Western psychology but I learned almost nothing about altered states of consciousness and exceptional experience. Then something unprecedented happened. One of my university lecturers for my degree asked me back to teach. I was terrified. Suddenly I found myself on the pointy end of the classroom. And that went well for a while. As I was commuting into central London one day on the train, I had what you might call an epiphany, this kind of aha moment. And it suddenly dawned on me what I needed to do. And that was to give up my job and go to Mexico and study shamanism. <laughs> so I told this to my colleague who'd given me the job. And of course, she was horrified. She said, if you go to Mexico and study shamanism, you'll go mad and you won't come back. That was 20 years ago. I've been at the University of Greenwich for 11 years, so I came back. I'm just not sure about the other bit. So I set off to Mexico and I, I knew virtually nothing about the country and even less about shamanism. Um, I've managed to learn a little bit. I'm going to tell you about what I think I know about it now. So shamans are people who go into an altered state of consciousness at will in the name of their community to communicate with the spirits of nature and to transcend time and space and bring back useful information for their community. It's quite a big job. They do this through various techniques, be it through dreaming or drumming or diet or dancing or through drugs. But they don't call them drugs. They call them medicines or they call them plant teachers or plant allies. In our parlance, the drugs they're referring to, or we're referring to, we call psychedelics. So I've had a long interest in the use of these psychedelics in a shamanic context. And the use of these substances goes back thousands of years on all parts of the planet, on every continent of the globe. We find shamans who make use of certain psychoactive plants, such as the huicholis in Mexico, who use the peyote cactus containing mescaline. Also in Mexico, with the Mazatec make use of this psilocybin-containing magic mushrooms. Other magic mushroom use we find in Siberia and northern Canada with this Amanita muscaria, beloved of children's fairy tales. Other parts of the world, such as India, we find the use of Dichura, or maybe Pachuri in Australia, or maybe Iboga in Africa, or Syrian rue in the Middle East. And of course, in the Amazon, we have a veritable cornucopia of various psychoactive psychedelic substances, such as ayahuasca. So ayahuasca is a kind of interesting one. And when it was originally isolated for its constituent chemicals about 100 years ago, they named one of the chemicals in it telepathine, on account of the fact that all the explorers and ethnobotanists who had encountered the use of this substance had had telepathic-like visions. And I was curious about that. Is it then that people other than shamans can have these experiences of transcending time and space? So we started doing my first bit of research. I did a survey and asked contemporary, modern day psychedelic users whether or not they'd had any of these kinds of experiences. And what I discovered was that 50% of people had taken a psychedelic substance had had an experience of telepathy under the influence of that substance. And that's quite an astonishing amount of people. If you compare that, for instance, to people using non-psychedelic substances like maybe heroin or alcohol or coffee or cocaine, people don't report having experiences of telepathy with those substances. So there's something very specific to psychedelics that induce these kinds of experiences. But are they real? Are they in any way genuine? Um, we have to apply the lens of science and look at these experiences within a controlled laboratory conditions to see if these effects are in any way genuine. So my research over the years, I've done a lot of experimental studies on precognition. 
So precognition is one of those apparent experiences where you can transcend time and get information back from the future without recourse to your usual sensory experience or through the means of inference. So I applied my research from precognition and wanted to take it into the psychedelic realm. So the thing about precognition and the study of it and the field of parapsychology more generally, it's been around for about 140 years and it's always been quite taboo. It's always been on the outside of the academy or at least on the edge. So I wanted to take that study and apply the study of psychedelics to that as well. And the thing about psychedelics is they've always been in this area of taboo research until very recently, neither of which attract very much funding. And so I did the unthinkable. I took two career suicide fields and I joined them together and committed double career Harry Carey. So the first of all, I went to Brazil. Um, I applied my precognition research to the use of ayahuasca in Christian syncretic churches which make use of an extremely potent jungle hallucinogen. Um, those experiments could have changed the world. However, it turns out my methodology wasn't very good, but there's no such thing as a failed experiment. And so I learned from that. I changed my design, my methodology, and this time I set off again for Ecuador. Having studied ayahuasca, I turned my attention to San Pedro cactus, which contains mescaline, much like peyote. So I wanted to do something similar to my previous experiment where I'd had managed to get 20 participants and get them to perform my precognition task, one trial each under the influence. I spent most of my time, however, on a limited budget, traveling around Ecuador trying to find a shaman who would let me do my experiments in their ceremony. I eventually found one and I thought, this is it, I'm going to make history. And I pulled out my laptop and he said, no, you're going to scare off all the spirits with your electromagnetic juju. And that was the end of that bit of research, or so I thought. I didn't want to go home empty handed with no data. And so I figured instead of getting 20 people to do my experiment, one trial each, if I just get one person to do all 20 trials, it's effectively the same thing. And so I did. And that was me. So this is how I find myself uh, doing this experiment. And the experiment goes like this. There's four stages to it. There's a visualization, then a viewing, then a voting, and then a verification. Anything beginning with V, basically. So in the visualization stage, under the influence of mescaline, I would merely close my eyes, and within all the enhanced mental imagery that the drug induces, I tried to visualize the future target, whatever that might be. And all I knew was that it would be a one minute video clip drawn randomly from some film or other. When I'd got my visualization, I would write it down, something concrete I could actually describe. And then I'd go on to the viewing stage and I would see four pre-prepared, randomized one minute video clips that were all very different from each other. And I'd view each one, but I wouldn't know what the target was. One of them would be chosen later as the target. And then I'd say, well, my visualization was perhaps maybe a little bit like the Matrix scene. Mm, a smidging of that thing of the overview effect. Virtually nothing like Rick and Morty and maybe a smattering of Mary Poppins. And so then I'll be able to rank these different video clips according to which one I thought my visualization was the most like. I'd done my voting. And finally, the final stage would be the verification. And to do that, a random number generator would be invoked to produce the actual target. The random number generator would decide which one of these four clips would be the future target. So I'm going to give you some of my cherry picked results before I tell you the actual answer. That is um, me high on San Pedro cactus, I presume. <laughs> that isn't the results. So this was my very first go. Uh, I didn't record the data from this. I just attempted to see if I could actually perform well in, in, in this experiment uh, under these circumstances. And this is my visualization. An ancient Greek scene, eyes, a city at night on a lake. And this was the one of the four clips, well, the first one I saw. Well, I could show that all day. When the clip ended after a minute, I found myself gripping the table, uh, wondering what was going to happen next and wondering why the clip had finished. And then I looked down and I saw what I'd written a few moments earlier 
ancient Greek scene, which I found to be somewhat encouraging. So I carried on with the experiment. I did a whole 20 trials and I'll cherry pick you some of the best examples. This is one I particularly like, which is very clear and direct, very simple, desert <coughs> dunes, the sands of time. And this is the one of the four clips, which I thought was most similar to my visualization. Desert dunes, the sands of time. <laughs> and there you have it. Uh, but the important thing is, but what did the computer decide was the target? And of course, when I ran the random number generator on this occasion, the computer also said, yes, that is the target. Now, they weren't always as direct as that because that'd be terrifying and astonishing in equal measure. They're often much more vague. Uh, often there would be, when I got it right, it would be on a thematic basis. So there'd be elements of my visualization which would be reflected in one of the video clips and I would choose. And this, this one highlights that particularly. So this is my visualization, rotating like helicopter blades, space, more mechanical stuff, spacecraft, space skeletons, and then a slightly different vision, water, a submarine, a big rig, but underwater. So something mechanical kind of floating. And this is the clip out of the four that I happened to choose. I think I just blasted They're coming through. Spacecraft, anybody? I mean, this is Star Wars. Space, more mechanical stuff. I mean, it doesn't get more mechanical than the Death Star, does it? I mean, it's a, a whole mechanical thing, the size of a planet. Um, and how about space skeletons? Do you think George Lucas, when he was designing the Stormtroopers, like, yeah, we want to have some kind of futuristic skeletons, you know, robot looking guys. And then finally, what about the helicopter blades? Well. Here we see Luke fumbling around in his utility belt, pulling out something that's going to save them. What is it? Some kind of grappling hook, maybe, swinging it around. We get a closer inspection of it, and we finally see... It looks like helicopter blades! So that, for me, was it... I didn't see him, his sister kissing him, though, unfortunately. Uh, my precognitive powers under the influence of mescaline were not that good. Uh, so you get the general idea, and finally, after the end of 20 trials, I managed to score much better than chance. It was at a 40% hit rate. Ultimately, that was significant, whereas we'd only expect 25% by chance. Now, that doesn't sound like anything astronomical, which it isn't, and it's only one experiment, so this isn't conclusive. This is just the start of a research paradigm. This is essentially a proof of process that it may be possible to do this kind of research. Um, I've since uh, repeated the experiment with other people, not just myself this time, under the influence of LSD, and another group of people under the influence of a drug called dimethyltryptamine, DMT, which is probably the most potent psychedelic known to humanity. And I'm gonna publish those results very soon. Meanwhile, I've embarked on a, on a new project, not just looking at precognition, but also telepathy, and having two people having the DMT experience at the same time, looking at C, seeing whether they can have a shared visionary experience whereby they have similar content to their visionary episode. So I've dedicated my whole career, probably I'm the kind of a solo career, doesn't seem to be anyone else doing this research, curiously, and uh, I've tried to apply the techniques of psychedelic parapsychology to the science of shamanism. And I think it has potentially important implications not just for understanding the nature of consciousness, but also the, perhaps the nature of time and maybe the nature of reality itself. Thank you very much.